so uh, let me then begin uh, uh, yeah as well i am at iit kanpur so these are the few things that we uh, work on uh, you can use a, i do have a see yeah. right so uh, as a group these are the few things i work on uh, optical coherence in time space angle uh, radial domain we also use partially coherent light that light field uh, with uh, different correlation properties and use that for imaging especially through scattering and turbulent media Uh, we work on quantum state reconstruction it could be in any basis uh, through coherence functionalism that's just a uh, one way but quantum state reconstruction in general and i focus uh, a majority of my time also on orbital angular momentum its detection its generation its entanglement and what we can do with it and also on quantification of coherence and entanglement uh, in 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 of high dimensional quantum state uh, so right so but in, for this talk i will mostly be concentrating on uh, these two things quantum state reconstruction and orbital angular momentum entanglement uh, detection generation and entanglement okay so with that this is uh, my group uh, and then these are the old group members whose work is included in what i am going to be presenting today along with my own group uh, i have had collaboration with uh, several here professor uh, van re of iit kanpur professor kedar khare of iit delhi jonathan leech of heritwood university mishkat bhattacharya rochester institute of technology minkel alonso from university of rochester and martin exter from light university of netherlands so uh, what i'm presenting these are also kind of part of that so just a brief intro to uh, what orbital angular momentum entanglement is what i'm presenting is not nothing new is uh, at least century old thing that people already know so this is the paraxial wave equation written in cylindrical coordinate uh, one of the solutions to this equation is called the laguerre gaussian solution laguerre gaussian modes uh, these modes well is a mathematical structure i don't want to go through the whole of it but the main thing i want to point out that these structures or these modes are characterized by two indices p and l uh and of course since it's written in cylindrical coordinate you have rho and phi here so now you see the phi dependence of these modes appear only uh, through this function it is the i l phi and l is the integer going from minus infinity to infinity p is also an integer going from zero to infinity so it's called the azimuthal mode index or oa mode index so this is called the radial mode index uh this is how these different terms look like if i look at the intensity of these beams for different p and l value that's how it looks l equal to 0 p equal to 0 just a gaussian mode the uh the beam of this laser the transverse profile of the laser pointer is very close to l equal to 0 p equal to 0 mode uh if at p equal to 0 if i increase l it becomes a donut mode or a vada mode and uh, as you increase l it becomes a bigger vada and so on if i increase p then this adds just the rings uh, uh to the more and more rings to that if you look at the phase profile of these modes for example here i'm uh, plotting the phase profile with p equal to 0 index of l equal to 0 l equal to 1 l equal to 2 modes so if it's a flat flat phase profile here the phase profile changes by 0 to 2 pi in one rotation here it changes to 0 to 4 pi in one rotation uh and if i look at how this phase profile changes as a function of z this is how it changes for this that phase profile remains the same nothing changes here the phase profile makes a helix and here the phase profile makes a double helix in the same distance so uh, th th this is all known uh, this was known uh, regarding oam what made this basis or oam kind of famous and important uh is this result in 1992 uh here what they showed in this paper is that uh in this laguerre gaussian mode if you take enough mode volume such that the total energy uh is h bar omega then corresponding to that the total orbital angular momentum will be l h bar so there's no extra quantization here just a uh, energy quantization but if you collect enough mode volumes as the total energy is h bar omega then the corresponding orbital angular momentum is h bar l so now this gives the interpretation that in these modes uh 
per photon, the orbital angular momentum that you can have is h bar l. And h is an integer, and then that makes it very exciting because for quantum computation and any quantum information, you need a discrete basis. We had a discrete basis in terms of polarization or spin, but now we have a discrete basis which is infinite dimensional, unlike polarization of spin, which is just two dimensional. Now I can have L can go from minus infinity to infinity, so I can have a subspace which can be five dimensional, 10 dimensional, 500 dimensional, 1000 dimensional. So I just add how we can explore these modes. So that made this, uh, the entire OAM, uh, very exciting for this quantum information community, this result. <coughs> Okay, now just to give some application of uh, OAM, some that is already in use, some that you know are uh, 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 in their process of evolution. So this is a result from 1994. This method came out there. Uh, this is called the STED uh, microscopy, stimulated emission depletion microscopy. It's a very simple idea. So you have a you have a exciting laser. This is a fluorescent excite, excitation laser, which is in the form of a Gaussian mode and a de-excitation or depletion uh, mode, which is in the form of a Laguerre Gaussian mode with a darkness in the center. Now you excite, de-excite, so the effective excitation area is much smaller than the actual beam. And this way uh, you are actually even beating the, uh, uh, you know, diffraction limit and so on. This is called super resolution. And if you compare confocal with the stead, that's the quality you can actually see. This even got the Nobel Prize about 12 years ago. Uh, for more quantum information related application, these are the results from 2000, uh, 2012, 2013. There they showed that using orbital angular momentum, you can do terabit free space data transmission. This is free space, and then these were done in uh, fibers uh, that you can actually use orbital angular momentum mode, multiplexing, demultiplexing for data transmission. Then this is a result from 2017, where they actually showed using high dimensional, uh, these modes, uh, the o OM carrying modes, you can do quantum cryptography. Uh, this is over 300 meters. And they, uh, here they are doing uh, cryptography through outdoor uh, underwater channel. This is just to show the kind of potential of these modes, how they can be used. and everybody's just trying to explore the higher dimensionality of it. So here it's uh, it's not 100 modes they're using, they're just using seven modes. And seven modes and, and how much you can kind of do it with it. Here to 2020, they have done a high dimensional quantum gate uh, using these, uh, uh, these modes. Again, I don't want to go through any of it, but just to show the variety of thing that people are uh, either using it or are in the process of getting there. Uh, this is efficient distribution of entanglement, high dimension entanglement through 11 kilometer fiber. Uh, free space, you can only do a few hundred meters, but fiber, you can actually uh, uh, go kilometers. Uh, and this is the result uh, from uh, 2023, uh, last year, where they actually made a new kind of fiber, which can uh, have up to 50 modes, 50 modes, and have it up to a kilometer without much loss and so on. Now, this talking to Siddharth, and he thinks this can be, you know, the entirely new way of now doing communication. It can completely change it, but that part we don't know right now. But this looks definitely very promising. A few applications that are, for example, ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. In uh, uh, here, they have done some quantum gate implementation also. Uh, but uh, again, this is QKD, so a single photon, not classical, so it's a single photon. Uh, and this is also QKD, so single photon. So several classical and quantum applications as well. Okay, so why is everybody excited about using high dimensional stuff for uh, 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 quantum information? Uh, because it gives you higher security in communication, gives you enhanced information capacity, gives you high noise robustness. You can have more noise in the system and you can still correct for it. This is compared to just having, let's say, spin basis of polarization basis, two-dimensional basis, noise tolerance is not as much. So that is the uh, advantage you can get. So these are the, you know, big points that one would kind of put in effort for, and that's why people are kind of excited. And, uh, what is the problem? Why are we not there yet? So of course, these are, uh, most of it is kind of theoretical. Yes, you can have these benefits, but, are we there? And if we are not there, what is the problem? 
So the major problem with the high dimensional modes is still, well, theoretically we can do it, but still generating it in a controlled way and also detecting it with uh, some efficiency, that is still a problem. That is still, uh, 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 you know, we are there, but not there completely yet. So first I'll just go through how we generate these modes and then so that I can kind of uh, uh, highlight more as to what exactly is the problem. So how do you generate this orbital angular momentum modes? The uh, very basic way of doing it is using what's called the spiral phase plate. Spiral phase plate is just a glass piece uh, whose thickness is varying as a function of phi. And if you have the variation uh, fixed properly, then you can have a, let's say, Gaussian flat uh, uh, phase front giving you a, helix, uh, a helical phase front and then this carries orbital angular momentum. Now, but of course with this you can only do one at a time. So if you want L equal to one, you have one device L equal to two, you need to have another device and so on. So uh, this you still use in some purpose, but, but majority of the time what we will use was called an SLM, spatial light modulator. What it does, it is an electronic device and you can put a kind of a hologram sort of, uh, you know, on that. Uh, now, with this hologram, if you have a Gaussian beam, flat phase front beam coming, uh, it gives you different diffraction order. If you sit on the first diffraction order, then that has your L equal to 1 mode. For example, I have put a specific hologram for L equal to 1, and then first diffraction order, I have my L equal to 1 beam generated. The efficiency of this process is pretty bad maximum 10 to 15 percent, but the purity is very high. So, you get a very uh, pure. OM carrying mode there, but of course if you put let's say one watt, maybe 10 percent or 15 percent of that you can actually convert. So efficiency is bad, but purity is pretty high. If you want to generate something else, you keep on sitting on the first order, just electronically change your hologram, let's say L equal to 2, and now you have L equal to 2 beam there. So this is just L equal to 1, L equal to 2, but you can have any superposition of all these modes that you can generate. So it's a very versatile, and that's what most people actually use it. Uh, so this is for generating single photon OM state. Now if I want to generate entangled photon state, how do I do it? So for generating entangled photon in the OM basis, uh, this is this is the way you do it. Uh, this is the uh, down conversion crystal, spontaneous parametric down conversion crystal is a BBO crystal. Uh, you have a pump photon uh, uh, with a Gaussian uh, pump. And then this generates these two photons called signal idler photon through uh, SPDC, spontaneous parametric down, which is a nonlinear optical process. And this gives you two photons which are kind of entangled in their uh, orbital angular momentum. That's how the mode looks like. Uh, sorry, that, that's how the uh, two photon state looks like if you util if, if you write in this uh, both L and P mode. But if I just if my detection is just sensitive to the L mode, then to a very good approximation you can actually write this uh, this state just as this. Now if you see this state, uh, it basically uh, uh, says that if the signal has orbital angular momentum LH bar, then idler is guaranteed to have orbital angular momentum minus LH bar. Okay? The signal, since it's a summation of minus infinity, the signal can have any L value, but if signal is found to have LH bar, idler is guaranteed to be minus LH bar. And that is what gives the orbital angular momentum entanglement. Well, just the uh, basic. Of course, for, to, for pro proving entanglement, you need to do more, but uh, 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 that is one consequence at least. And the weightage of a signal idler pair carrying some L value or SL pair, that's called the SL, that is the Smith spectrum. And uh, if you have just a BB or crystal typical setup, this is the kind of spectrum, SL spectrum that you actually get. This is a decaying exponential kind of uh, setup as a function of L that you get. Now, how people make different OM state is pump can be an OM beam in general, but here for to make it simple, this is just a Gaussian beam. With a Gaussian beam, this is the kind of profile you get. So uh, let's say when this, uh, this is just a kind of illustration. So if, if this is a Gaussian, this will also be a Gaussian. If this is a L equal to, uh, 1 p equal to 2, then that, that kind of L equal to minus 1 p equal to that kind of combination you will have. How do you? Right. So, uh, given this crystal, you don't have much uh, choice. 
but I'll come to that a little more. But for example, for this crystal, this is by default what you get. Right now, I'm not imposing any choice or any control way of doing it, which is what my aim is, by the way. But here, this is what I get by default. Uh, that you know, this is the this is the strength at l equal to zero, l equal to zero for signal idler. This is the strength at l equal to one minus one. This is the strength at l equal to two minus two, and so on. Beam what? Yes, yes, yes. All, all. Yes, yes, yes. So it is very, very broad. Or oh, this is a cartoon, but typically I'll show you the results also. We have gotten uh, these uh, states with 250 dimensions also. So we can get 250 dimensional OM modes uh, that we can produce in the lab. Here's just a cartoon, so I'm just showing a few. So the way uh, you do some choosing, I mean, you're talking about choosing, is uh, it's kind of like a little dumb. Uh, it's a, using this post selection, just cut off what you don't want, keep the rest. So that's how if I want a rectangular spectrum, I'll just cut off uh, what I don't want and then just keep the rest. But so, but the post selection always causes uh, issues. Uh, the, if I'm using quantum information, the security will be the first issue that will actually show up. So ideally, what I would want is to be able to generate uh, this OM entangled state without post selection. So this post selection part is a huge limitation that we have here. Now coming to the detection, what is the limitation? So uh, the way we detect OAM, there are several, but I'm just showing one, which is the most widely used. Uh, uh, this came up in 2001. This is just the exact opposite of how I showed the generation method. <coughs> so I have this input field, which has can have all kinds of L value. I don't know, this is an unknown field. And the OAM distribution, actually I want to uh, uh, detect. So how do I do it? Again, this is an SLM with certain SLM, uh, sorry, certain hologram that I put, and then uh, 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 I focus it onto an objective lens and on a single mode fiber. Why single mode fiber? Because single mode fiber collects only L equal to zero mode. It's just a fundamental L equal to zero mode it collects. Uh, now with this, let's say, for example, if I put an L equal to minus five hologram, and I have an input field that contains all these modes, you know, from, and I'm just showing L equal to four, five, six. Now, what this L equal to minus five hologram will do, it will actually change the OM index of all these uh, modes after this uh, uh, a hologram. And so this L equal to four, five, six will become L equal to minus one, zero, L equal to one. Okay. Now, if I'm collecting it using a single mode fiber, single mode fiber gets only L equal to zero mode. And this L equal to zero mode with L equal to minus five was actually L equal to five mode here. So L equal to minus five, whatever I did, that actually was L equal to five in the incoming mode, okay? Now, if I want to get something else, let's say I put L equal to minus six, same mode. Now this time, L equal to six will become zero. And now if I collect single, anything in single mode fiber, that will be proportional to the content in L equal to six. So that's why by changing this hologram one by one, you actually scan the whole field and uh, that way you can just have the kind of spectrum over here. So what is the problem here? This seems pretty nice, but no, the problem here is this has, because of this fiber, this has a limited modal capacity. So here, for example, this is the input mode uh, going from minus 50 to 50, but a fiber, if you fix its, uh, uh, you know, these, these, these parameters can only get this much. So you can also see it has non-uniform modal capacity. The, the efficiency with which it detects L equal to zero is very different than the efficiency with which it detects L equal to one, two, and so on. Here is a little exaggeration just to kind of bring the point uh, uh, here. And of course, then since it has, it doesn't have the uniform modal capacity, modal efficiency, it does not, uh, you know, get the true OM spectrum. So here, this is a true, should be the true OM spectrum, but this is what you will actually detect using a fiber. So the 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 most uh, widely used method currently has all these limitations. We have problem with the lim uh, generation. We have problem with the limitations with the uh, uh, generation. Uh, sorry, a detection. So what I want to show you is uh, our work in uh, uh, you know in this direction where we have found efficient ways of detecting OAM of photon and also post-selection free way of generating OAM entangled state. And if I, if, if there's time, then I can also talk about the form of entanglement that we have found that revives itself uh, even in the presence of turbulence. Yes. Mm -hmm.
Mm-hmm. You're talking about the Bob White Miles Paget that work? With the multiple copies and the, yeah, yeah, okay, 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 okay. Uh, uh, yes, uh, I, I'll come back to just, uh, 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 I won't come back to, but now that you have said, I'll actually connect, connect that to what I have it over here. Huh? Um, any other? Okay. So, so for the efficient detection of OAM photon, uh, so first of all, what do we mean by uh, photon detection? Uh, so photon detection would mean that, of course, I have a light, could be single photon, just could be when tube light, everything is made of photon. Uh, uh, at the basic level, everything is quantum, uh, so th there's no issue. Now, uh, so what do we mean by we have, a, we have light and then we have single photon detector. That is the most important part. So we do detect single photon, but that's not it. We also need to have what basis we are doing the detection in. So I want to detect single photon, but in what basis? So let's say uh, if I want to detect the single photon in position basis, then what I need to do, I need to do nothing. I just have this camera and the pixels of these different pixels of the camera correspond to different location of the photon. So this pixel basis actually becomes my position basis. So if I detect a photon here, that means this is a single photon at this location, single photon at this location and so on. If I want to have, if I want to detect the momentum of a photon, then what do I do? I have my single photon camera. I put a lens and keep the camera at the back focal plane of the lens. Okay, and then this uh, uh, with this setup, the each pixel what I get correspond to different momenta of the photon or spatial frequency. So if, now if I get a photon with the lens being here and the, this camera being at the focal uh, plane, this will correspond to one momentum, this will correspond to another momentum, single photon and so on. So now I can say I've detected the momentum of the single photon. Frequency, I put a prism and then each point, uh, well it should be maybe uh, just a uh, one dimensional, uh, uh, e each point can then be correspond to the frequency of a photon. So now the question is, if I want to detect the OEM of photon, orbital angle momentum of photon, what do I do? What is the device that I want to put here? Okay, uh, that is a big question. This has been a big question and that is still is a big question and then that will connect to what you were just asking kind of like a moment ago. Uh, so uh, we don't have a perfect answer yet. There are several uh, attempts, but we don't have a perfect answer yet. So I was also working for quite some time, but uh, still not successful. But uh, one idea that we worked on is that if you have a converging lens, uh, the, what a converging lens does, you have a plane wave, it just focuses the plane wave to a point. So it converts a plane wave to like a delta function, to within uh, some point spread function of it. And if you have different plane wave, it focuses this to some other point. So uh, uh, the, 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 the a converging lens is a sorter, in, that means it spatially separates uh, 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 light containing different momenta value or photons containing different momenta value. Now, if you look at the transmission function of a lens, it is of the this type, x squared plus y squared. So we thought if we can do a, what's called an angular lens that just have a transmission function, which has this phi squared, just like x squared, y squared, we have phi squared. Uh, then what happens, okay? And then this beta rho we put from some other experience. This is basically a trial function. So this is this is how the uh, uh, this, this this piece would look like. And the idea is whether you know this L1 and L2 mode, if whether they, they focus at different uh, uh, you know azimuthal position. And the answer actually is yes. This is how it works. And this is the result we got. Uh, that uh, this is this is like the sh single shot that just a one element it comes in. And then you find that different OM modes are focusing at different point. So this is almost a perfect solution, except that I cannot sort fully. For example, this is a, this corresponds L equal to zero, L equal to four, L equal to eight, minus four, minus eight. So I can separate L equal to zero from L equal to four, but I can't separate L equal to zero from L equal to one. So that is the limitation. Of course, I can here it can be L equal to zero, L equal to three, but if I go low, the my uh, you know, m space kind of becomes smaller. If I can go for L equal to six, then I can have more modes and so on, but it's still not a perfect solution. There are several other works which you were kind of referring to, which is very similar in this direction that single element or few elements, and then try to see if one can actually sort. Uh, I don't have 
all those works kind of listed here. The uh, issue with all that is nobody has characterized actually how much you put in versus how much you actually get. Yes, you can separate, but that is just the uh, verification of how many modes you have, but that's not the reconstruction that they can have. Uh, then, so for example, here I have a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 12 modes, for example. If I go, then everything becomes like a blob. So there's, and I don't even know, uh, for example, A to C. So, okay. So this is the uh, alpha beta parameter we're showing. This is alpha and this is beta. So I'm just waiting this alpha and beta value. Z remains same. Z is where I put this device and this is my screen. That is Z distance. Z remains same. I'm just waiting this alpha, beta and different values. And that's what we get. Uh, and this is theory. This is experiment. Uh, but of course, this is not a perfect solution. Right. So there again, there are other efforts very uh, uh, in, in a very similar direction for, for sorting the modes, but so far uh, uh, no perfect solution uh, yet. Maybe there is, and that's what we would like if there is a perfect solution there. Uh, of course, if I'm showing you this image, <laughs> it's not a single photon, but it, there's no difference whether I have classical light or single photon because I can generate this one photon by one photon, and then ultimately it will give me exactly the same image. So, so as far as it being uh, working at single photon highlight level, there is no difference. Yeah, yeah, correct, correct. That is not, no, 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 that is, uh, right. So if I know that my incoming beam has only four OAM modes, I can do it 100%, no issue at all. But if I know I have 100, then that's a problem. Or even 10 is a problem, actually. Uh, four, five, perfectly fine. Uh, in fact, there's a perfect solution for two, but that <laughs> two, two won't work. And then there's a perfect solution at this concatenated marks and interferon. I'm not putting all that in because not, nothing is a perfect solution yet. So, but it becomes very complicated very soon. So four, four modes, no issue at all. One can actually do, but, but more than that, uh, the complexity, you know, increases exponentially and even theoretically no perfect solution yet. Yes. Here I have to know because I know what I'm putting so that I, I'm, I'm, Number of modes, uh, so L equal to zero to 84, sorry, minus 84 to 84 with the gap of six. How much is that? Yeah, I mean, maybe f how much? 60, 40, something like that. Huh. So here, here experimentally, we are generating all these modes using an SLM because I have to know what it is and then see what I'm getting so that I can check you know, what the reconstruction was and how good the reconstruction was. So here I do know what I'm actually sending in. Here also, in the theory also, we send and then we say what kind of pattern we get. So the pattern, there's a pattern matching here is what's going on, but I do know what uh, input more. But now that I know this works, then I can just uh, put in an input, uh, unknown input and then use this uh, uh, thing for that. Yes. 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 Otherwise, the uh, the basis goes to minus infinity to infinity. But of course, uh, here uh, it kind of wraps itself, and th that's why. Uh, yes. Yes. Okay. Now, uh, so we then uh, took a uh, different route altogether for uh, uh, you know making doing state measurement in the OM basis. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, here, uh, you just, no fitting parameters here. No, 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 no. I mean, of course you can say, I have not really calculated the fidelity here. Oh, no. Exactly. Yeah. It just looks hard. So it will be very close. 
Yeah, so I, I'm not showing it here. Then we, what we did, we actually put, a, uh, we did uh, like uh, put a hard aperture uh, numerically and then tried calculating the, so it's more than 95, 96%. I don't have that number. It, it's, it's pretty good. So this is almost a perfect solution, except I cannot uh, distinguish from L equal to zero and L equal to one. From L equal to zero, L equal to four, it is actually almost perfect solution. Yes. It's overlapping. Yeah, yeah. So this, this 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 pattern L equal to zero and one. This is just overlapping, so I can't separate. No, it's theoretical. For example, like even you, when you have a lens, no, uh, this is not a delta function. It's a point spread function. Here we know if I increase the aperture of the lens, this thing will become smaller and smaller. And when this aperture becomes infinite, it's a delta function. But here I haven't identified that knob, you know, which will actually make the width of this smaller and smaller. That we have not been able to identify. So that is still, even, even theoretically, I don't know how to do it. Yes. That's what they did, Miles and Bob. They had the multiple copies. Yes. Yes, yes. But that the since they are doing a kind of diffractive way, now how much is the loss? And what I'm seeing versus what I put in, there is no calibration. There's no way of when one can do the calibration there. That, that, that was a problem there. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, there are there are those methods, but yes, but with that you can only go and sort two modes and so on. But if I want to do like a 10, 20, 100, then that will not work uh, beyond a point. Yes, 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 yes. The Q, Q plates and so on people do use, but you can only do two modes there, not more than that. Yes, uh, yes. Okay, so, um, so yeah, then we change the direction and then this is a uh, uh, very different way of, kind of doing the detection because if you want to use, I mean, I wanted to get into the OM uh, high dimensional uh, basis for QKD and quantum information, but there's no detected, no way of, uh, so that's why for almost last seven, eight years, I've been kind of working in this field. Uh, and I think now we have very close to uh, 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 a very good solution, if not perfect solution. So if I write the quantum state in the orbital angular momentum basis of a photon, it looks like this, the orbital angular momentum basis, this is just the density matrix. Uh, of course, one in principle knows how to reconstruct the density matrix, that's called the quantum state tomography, but quantum state tomography is although known how to do it, it's very, very difficult. What we were after is finding efficient way of doing quantum state tomography. So you can make things efficient if you only utilize some symmetry, some structure of the density matrix. So first uh, was this, this, this our very first work that if let's say the density matrix, if you have the prior information, the density matrix looks like this, that's a diagonal state, diagonal density matrix, then we have a very uh, efficient way of measuring OAM. So this was the, uh, uh, our way of doing it. Very simple Marx and interferometer, nothing complicated. But this Marx and interferometer has odd and even number of meters in the two arm. That's the only difference. Otherwise just a regular Marx and interferometer. Physics that works here is, a mirror actually uh, uh, reflects upon reflection, e to the minus IL5 mode will become e to the plus IL5. Just the, that's the only thing. Now with this physics, if I uh, send in this kind of density matrix uh, to this interferometer, then what do I see at the output of this interferometer? I won't go through the entire math, but just want, want to show the kind of output of this interferometer for a certain phase difference within the interferometer. It looks like this. Some you have, so we can have some background noise, and then uh, you know, for this K1 term, if only this arm was open, K2 term, if only this arm was open, and both arms are open, then this is the cross term that you actually get. This W of two phi, that's called the angular coherence function of the field. Of course, delta is the phase difference. 
So uh, again, I'm not going through the math completely, but if somebody is interested, we can go uh, uh, more deeper. So here, uh, what is hap what is happening here? This is the intensity we get. Now what we do is we take this intensity pattern at two different values of delta. Okay. Now if I do that, then I have this difference intensity uh, at these two different delta values, and this difference intensity uh, then doesn't have this k1 k2 term, and if the background noise is constant uh, uh, between these two shots, then this delta i n is also zero. And so what I have is this difference intensity image is actually proportional to the angular coherence function of the field coming in. And for such a diagonal density matrix, angular coherence function and spectrum, which is the diagonal element, they make a Fourier pair. So just by measuring the difference intensity, I can actually get this and through this in by inverting it, I can calculate the spectrum. That's a very efficient way of measuring the OM spectrum. So two intensity shot and get the whole spectrum. Uh, it's two mirror. Two mirror, there's no advantage, just experimentally, you know, one mirror is almost impossible. So that's why just two mirror. I uh, minus yeah so just a reflection correct j just a reflection so odd and even number of reflections I need yes and the, how one does it doesn't matter correct so here is a result if I do just a one shot construction then you definitely say it's noisy uh, this second shot noisy but if I actually work with the difference image then it's a pretty good reconstruction and what I'm doing here is I I generate an state input state using an SLM and then kind of put it in and then try to see how good my reconstruction is. So yeah, it's good, but maybe there's a generation error and so on. So now we wanted to make use of it. And so we go back to the entangled state uh, in the OM basis that we generate. And this is the state that we have that I was talking about. And uh, we would like to first measure this SL, which is the OM Schmidt spectrum. Uh, now, uh, one thing I want to point out here, this is a two photon state, but let's say if I take the trace over the idler mode, then one can from this two photon state, one can actually obtain the state of the signal photon. Now, this is a pure state, but the state of the signal photon looks like this, which is actually a di diagonal density matrix. And I now know how to measure the diagonal density matrix. So if I just take the signal photon and measure this uh, spectrum, that actually is the spectrum of my entangled photon. So uh, so this is the uh, BBO crystal. We generate entangled photon. Then we actually try to measure it. This is the first shot. This is the second shot. We have put it together. This is the reconstruction here. So this two shot, I, I can get this reconstruction. And this is about <coughs> 82 dimensional state is what we can actually get in just two shot measurement. Of course, there is a it is perfect fit except for this point. And again, we were a little unhappy. So we. Uh, included in the theory, the tilt of the crystal. And if you do include the tilt of the crystal, then we can have a, you, you know, even perfect fit. And if you increase uh, the tilt more and more, uh, here is what we could generate 229 dimensional state with almost perfect fit measured in just two shot. So after this work, then uh, we actually then uh, design a new interferometer, but for this kind of state, which is a pure state. So again, this is not the most general state, just a pure state. So I have now all the terms, not just the diagonal, but the condition is trace row is equal to trace row square. <laughs> now with this kind of uh, state, we designed a new interferometer, again, odd even mirror combination, but uh, I have this device called the uh, Dove Prism. Now, what a dub prism does is it rotates the uh, wave front of light going inside. Anything goes inside, it just rotates the wave front. If I'm looking at you through dub prism, my face will completely rotate by, you know, uh, 4 pi if you rotate the dub prism by 2 pi. So using this, and we design a nine shot trick and technique, and that way we can actually measure the uh, 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 pure state in the OM basis. Here it is up to 11 dimension, more than 95, 90% 90 fidelity that we are getting. 
Uh, after this, more recently, we have designed a developer method for a general density matrix. So the density matrix is, there's no restriction, but the detection wise, we are only measuring the diagonal elements, okay, which is the spectrum. So no constraint on the uh, density matrix incoming, but we'll only get the diagonal element. And of course, if I get everything that's a quantum state tomography and there's no efficient method for that, but if I am interested only in the diagonal, then I can have an efficient method. So this is our interferometer. Now you see there's a dub prism here, odd even, uh, 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 sorry, there's no need for odd even here, or we can have odd even also. But the major point is I have a dub prism, which I will continuously rotate. And with the continuous rotation, if I, again, I won't go through the math. If I do the uh, two short subtracted intensity, then I would be able to kind of uh, get the spectrum uh, in this case for a general density matrix. But there was two problem. One was uh, this commercially available dub prism when you actually rotate the beam instead of, in addition to rotating, also shifts laterally, okay? Uh, either uh, this lateral shift or you can have this angular shift and so on. And so commercially available, available dub prism, you have uh, more than 100 milli radian of angular shift uh, typically. So we worked on that for almost two years, couldn't find a solution. Then we looked at this paper from 2010. They had, instead of dub prism, they were using this device, just essentially three mirrors. So then we contacted Martin at that point, and then he loaned uh, us his image rotator. This is called a K mirror, it's not dub prism, but it also does just image rotation. So with this, with his device, we can actually get it down to one milli radian, from 100 milli radian to one milli radian. But this was still not enough because our aim was to be able to measure 100 dimensional modes, not just two or four. So finally, then we act, uh, ended up kind of uh, automating the whole setup so that we have uh, we we kind of correct for this, you know, one milli radian thing that we have uh, after you know every every once in a while. And with that, we were actually now able to uh, are able to get uh, less than 30 micro radians. The other issue was that if you send a light through a dub prism or a K mirror, uh, of course it rotates the wave front, but in addition it also changes its polarization. And if you actually look at the polarization state on the point curve sphere, this is the input mode, but the output state as a function of the rotation of the image rotator does this on a point curve sphere. So if the polarization state changes, that's a problem. So we found a way of kind of quantifying the polarization change. And then we also find a configuration of, the, uh, sorry, image rotator that minimizes this polarization change. So from this pink, which is supposed to be this, we can actually get it down to like this. So we are kind of making this in our lab, but uh, in the meanwhile, we also found a solution, way of kind of bypassing the polarization change through renormalization. So what I'm, the results that I'm going to show you will be through renormalization. But if we don't do renormalization, that will improve our signal to noise a little more. So this is the, our current result. This is just submitted, not published yet. Uh, so we have now kind of like a broadband uniform efficiency OM detector. So all the three uh, uh, issues that I was pointing out, I, we feel that we have actually fixed it. If you have a discrete pure state uh, uh, input, uh, we can actually get it to be this 98% fidelity. Here is a general mixed state. Uh, we can also get it to 98% fidelity. This is a diagonal mixed state. Uh, this is, of course, this results looks much better than this. And the reason is this general mixed state I was producing using SLM and there's a, a, a you know, generation error in SLM. I didn't know what, was it, but, but what you were pointing out. Maybe it, it could be that uh, there's, there's really no control I have. But here, the I'm not generating my state using SLM. I'm just using SPDC output as the uh, state and I know how to characterize it. So here, probably there's no generation error, so the fit is much nicer. So we can get it up to more than 99% fidelity. So that's showing the broadband uniform efficiency UM detection. Uh, and just to show the uh, comparison with the uh, with this uh, fiber-based method for these setups, the best after uh, uh, you know optimizing all these parameters. This is actually theoretical value. This is our, our experimental result with my detect our detector, and this is uh, what you can get with the single fiber base. So you see, even if the mode is from minus 50 to 50, the fiber can only get up to minus 15 to minus 50, plus 15. So the modal uh, the width is not that much, efficiency is also not as much, and of course you don't get the true spectrum. Okay, uh, so uh, next uh, what I want to uh, uh, show is that some, uh, some of our work for the generation, and we found a new way of uh, generating OM, in OM entangled state that is completely post-selection free. Yes. There could be. Uh, 
since uh, the OAM basis works very similar to number and phase will be angle. So OAM and angle will be very close to number and phase. So one can in principle, but uh, uh, I haven't done that, but uh, maybe when I show you this work there, I think we can have a very, we have very good control, not perfect control, but very good control. And maybe those things can be done. Yes. Mm. Uh, what is that? Uh -huh. So it definitely uh, correct, so, correct, correct. So the negative in the Wigner, uh, right? So so that is a signature of the coherence of the field, whether it is single photon field, highlight field, and so on. Uh, that is what sometimes you will also connect to the non-classicality that the classical field. So here also, uh, if I just do o in the OM basis, there will be a structure. If I actually, now I think probably what you're asking, if that structure can be connected to the OM entanglement, that I don't know. And I don't think anybody has done it. Huh. Yes, 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 yes. I think there should be, but I don't think if anybody has done it. Uh, that, that, that question I also have in my mind for quite some time, but yeah, I have not kind of uh, really started working on it, yes. But there should be something like that, yes. Uh, yes, 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 yes. So th we can have two separate Wigner function for this particle, that particle, and one Wigner function for two particle state. And with all these three, one should be able to have some connection of entanglement. So I am actually doing a little bit of that when I'm saying that my fifth point, uh, quantifying coherence and kind of entanglement or rather quantifying entanglement through coherence channel and Wigner function is nothing but just a coherence. So that is part of the plan, but again, I have not been able to do much there. And I have not seen anybody kind of, uh, you know, have that kind of quantification method for entanglement, but it should be possible, I think. Okay, so, uh, <clears throat> right. So uh, th this is what I was pointing out regarding the generation of uh, 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 OAM entangled state. Uh, that uh, ideally one would want to have any state, but typically what you do is just select a part of the state. Uh, recently, we came up with this method that uh, let's have uh, uh, these OAM mode pump with P equal to zero uh, or several P values. This is the coherent superposition of all these P values. Uh, these alpha zero to alpha N minus one are the uh, weightage of all these different P values. And the question is by optimizing these alphas, can I generate the spectrum that I want? So we spent some time kind of fixing it uh, uh, theoretically, analytically, but we couldn't succeed. So uh, we are now doing kind of uh, numerically and just kind of experimentally that I have some target spectrum in mind. I put a combination of these P modes, see what the spectrum is. If it's not there, then just modify it, kind of do it few round and it kind of gets there in few iterations. And this, uh, we kind of quantify that through this coefficient of determination. So I'll just show you the uh, kind of experimental setup and experimental result. So this is my pump, uh, some optics. This is the SLM where I put different, uh, you know, P mode combination, that's my BBO crystal. And this is anyway my OAM detector, which I was showing just a few slides ago. So here we detect the OAM and it goes here, changes the combination and you do a few round. Again, I won't go through the math, math is similar. And this is the result we actually get. Uh, so here we are able to get the Gaussian spectrum with 99% fidelity, triangular spectrum, very similar efficiency, but for rectangular spectrum, we only get 85% fidelity. Uh, the, the reason is here for uh, producing these modes, I was just using five uh, P modes, P equal to zero, one, two, three, four. And just by that combination, we're trying to see if we can have this control. So of course, this is 90 more than uh, about 99%, but for the rectangular spectrum, this was only 85%. Uh, so we sent it to the referee and he said, well, this is too less. <laughs> we can reach 90, we can take it. Fine. So, uh, yes, 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 yes. That, that, that was a complaint. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so we took that complaint kind of seriously. Uh, and then we just did the numerical simulation. The reason was, since I'm just using 5P modes, uh, with 5P modes, Reaching just sharp edges is very difficult. Just if you just do, uh, uh, you know, if you think of any transform, uh, 
SAR pages, you require infinite number of modes and you can't really get it. So if you increase the number of modes, then of course we could reach more than 96% and so on. Uh, but there was some practical limitation. So we had to kind of uh, more P modes as you increase the P mode, the beam size becomes bigger. If the beam size become bigger, I need to have a bigger crystal. So we order a big, bigger crystal. We went up to N equal to eight modes uh, and then the efficiency, sorry, fidelity was up to 90%. Uh, this limitation is actually just a practical limitation because uh, in this setup, we were not doing any automated uh, kind of optimization. Optimization was not automated, it's more like manual. We see what we get and then change manually this coefficient. If you So earlier we were using five millimeter by five millimeter or transverse, then we bought 10 millimeter by 10 millimeter. Yes, and then we could fit more modes. 100 milliwatt. But I think it was not 100 milliwatt because once you have this SLM, uh, essentially it was like 5 to 6 milliwatt is what we were using. And that was enough uh, for, for what we were doing. So if we could automate, then I think very easily, uh, we didn't have mu uh, that much money. So if we could just automate uh, 20 and 30 more with all these new codes of machine learning and all that, this 20 more, 30 more is very easily achievable. And this thing going to 95, 96, 98% also is very, very easy. But uh, that is not the whole point. The point is, uh, of course, this is maximal entangled state, but now um, there are results which shows that there are uh, uh, quantum information protocol, especially through if the, if the channel has turbulence and scattering, then you don't want a maximal entangled state. You want non-maximal entangled state, which, which have optimal performance. So the whole point is by having control on these P modes, one can generate any entangled state non-maximally, maximally, and so on. And this provides kind of like a control. With n equal to 15, I mean, very easily 96% can be achieved. Okay, so maybe you have five minutes? Okay. 10, okay. Okay, so uh, then I'll just talk very quickly about uh, uh, this this uh, uh, this recent work that we did. This is about OAM entanglement and how it kind of... Uh, uh, so now in the... Uh, in the continuous variable basis, we have entanglement again, you have to have it in basis, we have polarization entanglement, we have time energy entanglement, position of time entanglement, angle of entanglement. So entanglement is always in some basis. Uh, we know how to quantify entanglement only for two dimensional discrete basis. But if the entanglement is in position momentum angle OM, we know how to verify it, witness it, but we don't know how to quantify it. That is still a problem. So in the uh, continuous variable of position momentum, this is how we understand entanglement, which is called position momentum entanglement. And it is called uh, EPR correlation or, or EPR entanglement. And this is how it works, that if you have this entangled photons coming out, and if this is where you detect the idler photon, let's say at yi equal to zero, and then you go check what is the area or distance over which you detect the signal photon, then it will have some value, let's say delta ys. And this is called the conditional position uncertainty of the signal photon given that the y, uh, sorry, the idler is already detected, okay? Similarly, you can have, you can measure the momentum of idler and then ask the question, what is the conditional momentum uncertainty of the signal photon? And it turns out that the uh, product of this conditional uncertainties can be less than 0 0.5 h bar for entangled photons. And in fact, if it is less than 0 0.5 h bar, then you call them position momentum entangled, otherwise not. Similarly, you can have it for angle OM as well. For example, if I detect uh, the idler photon at theta i equal to zero, what is the angular width over which I detect the idler? That will be its conditional angle uncertainty. Similarly, I can have conditional L uncertainty. And if that product is less than 0 0.5 h bar, we can ignore this product. Uh, then we can call it angle OM entanglement. So again, this is just a witness. It's not a quantification. It's just a yes or no kind of answer that we can actually get from here. Now in a regular SPDC or BBO crystal setup, if you generate these photons, they are indeed entangled in position momentum. But after some Z, if you do this test, you find that they are not entangled, okay? In the angle OM basis, when you do, you find of course they're entangled in the beginning. Then the you, you don't verify entanglement, but the entanglement comes back after a while. So that's what we are calling the revival of entanglement. This you see in the angle OM basis. Of course, this is just a cartoon. Now, if I show you uh, the, the, there's just a numerical values that we put in. There is nothing certain about it. Uh, there is nothing certain about it. This and this. Ah, so for, 
right, so for angle OM, I have to do this test. The conditional angle uncertainty times conditional angular momentum uncertainty. For position momentum, I have to do conditional position uncertainty times the conditional uh, uh, momentum uncertainty. Experiment. I, I'll show the experiment. I'll show, I'll show the, this is a cartoon. I mean, I'll, I'll show the experiment. Uh, so this is just again a kind of numerical uh, 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 simulation. So here just showing the conditional position uncertainty. This is conditional angle uncertainty. Uh, and this, this is how it actually uh, uh, looks. The conditional position uncertainty keeps on increasing. Of course, the rate uh, uh, is very fast in the near field, goes down in the far field, and this is how it does for the angle. Uh, so experiment-wise, this is how we uh, measure position and angle measurement, just a pump, BBO crystal, and the EMC CD. EMC CD is a single photon detector, but you can actually use EMC CD also to do uh, coincidence detection. It, it, it takes a while, of course, 12 hours data uh, taking and 12 hours of data processing, but you can actually use an EMC CD for uh, coincidence detection as well, uh, space result uh, uh, coincidence detection. Uh, so we use this setup for doing amp position and angle measurement. We use this setup, uh, you know, just the lens combination is changed for doing momentum measurement and this setup where we have a split and then using you know fiber uh, for the angular momentum measurement. Ideally, I would like to get rid of this, but I think what we have in the lab, uh, what I have showed in the other part, we have a detector, perfect detector for single photon detection, OM detection, but here I'm detecting two photon for which I don't have a perfect detector that is uh, you know uh, non-fiber based, but we are actually very close to kind of uh, uh, there. So that's a setup for orbital angular momentum entanglement. And if you put it all together, these are the experimental result. That's a simulation, that's the experimental result. Third place is the room heater that we, a small room heater that we actually just put. Uh, so, so here is the result. Uh, uh, these are the kind of external point. Of course, you see up to a few centimeters, this is entangled, but you lose entanglement, doesn't come back. But in angle OM, uh, yes, you do lose it, but then it does come back. Uh, so you revive your entanglement as equal to 24 uh, centimeters. So the point is, if it does revive, then can it do the same thing in the presence of turbulence as well? So to test that, we then put this uh, room heater, which is about at z equal to 15 centimeters, and this is the result. Uh, this uh, like there's no data point before z equal to 15, and then you do see the as the entanglement does revive, but uh, in the presence of turbulence, you see the revival happens a little later. So if this was z equal to 24, this becomes z equal to 35 centimeters, uh, uh, and of course, if there is if the strength of the turbulence is stronger, then of course the revival will happen a little, you know, even further away. But the revival does happen, and once the revival happens, it stays entangled. It, it, there is no kind of losing of it, as long as the trace of the system is preserved, as long as you collect the entire light. So that's how it actually works. Ah. Yeah, I I don't that that question I don't know. Yes, 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 yes. It 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 can uh, uh, it can damage <laughs> it can damage it more strongly. Yeah, so that, that that I don't know. Correct, correct, correct. Real, real, <laughs> real turbulence. Yes, yes. Uh, okay, so that actually brings me to the. Uh, The uh, so it only depends on uh, yes, 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 yes. And after that, we have done simulation that it stays revived. Of course, the lab we could only do up to a few meters, uh, but we have uh, seen, for example, let's say if I am doing it over 100 meters or one kilometers, then of course, these are diffracting beams, so they will diffract. Uh, but as long as let's say with one inch optics that won't work but if i increase the size of my optics then this strain actually continues but if i lose my light then of course this will actually will increase uh, that we cannot say for a continuous variable anyway yes 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 okay correct correct so that is correct. So we can only have it a yes or no answer. And, uh, actually, the natural question, of course, I think, sir, maybe is all, already there in the audience, is that then this is all, you know, just a unitary transformation. Where does entanglement go? 
the the quick answer to that is uh, it entanglement kind of migrates to other bases because I can have position momentum, I can have angle OM, maybe it shows somewhere else because unitary transformations are not supposed to. I mean, if I don't look at turbulence, just this one, unitary transformation are not supposed to you know destroy anything. Uh, but but this is if 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 there is a quantifier of entanglement, it will not see. I'm guessing it will not see this kind of effect, but a verifier of entanglement, which is what we have for condensed well, it does see that effect. So you can't really be sure if you do have entanglement in the angle OM basis, you know, let's say in this region, but here you definitely are perfectly sure. Okay, so that brings me to the summary. So what I have kind of uh, shown you uh, is some uh, efficient ways of measuring OM uh, of photon and maybe we'll uh, within next six months or something, we'll also have a uh, efficient detector for the uh, entangled photons. This is just for single photon at this point. Uh, we, I've also shown you a way of doing, a uh, way of generating uh, OM entangled state in a post-selection free method, which will be which could be very important for uh, doing uh, secure quantum information protocols and so on, and a form of entanglement which revives itself through in the presence of turbulence. So uh, thanks to the funding agencies and thank you for your attention.